Hola. Hola. Buenas tardes. Um, ok, so welcome to the course Procesamiento Masivo de Datos. Um, I teach the course in English, um, but feel free to uh, ask me questions or respond in Spanish. Um, in general, no part of the course in, in everything in the labs and the uh, tareas and everything, you can respond in Spanish. So there, there's no problem with that. Uh, so long as you can hopefully understand me, hopefully my accent is, my Irish accent isn't too strong. <laughs> um, so, Procesamiento Masivo de Datos, or Big Data, um, or PATOS, as some people call it. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about the course. I'm going to introduce and motivate the course. Um, so, let's see, I can change my slide. So, I'm going to start with the story about the value of data. Uh, in general. So um, if we want to think about the value of data, an um, interesting story or anecdote comes from uh, Soho in London in 1854. And at this time, there was a problem. Um, so the issue they had was a, an outbreak of cholera. So cholera was what is cholera? Cholera is, if we look at a definition now, an infectious and often fatal bacterial disease of the small intestine. Intestino delgado, I think it's called. Um, I'm not sure. Typically contracted from infected water supplies and causing severe vomiting and diarrhea. So this is what we know now. What we knew in 1854 was considerably less. We knew that it was an infectious and often fatal disease causing severe vomiting and diarrhea. This was in the days before we even had developed the theory of bacteria. Um, so it, nothing was known about bacteria at this time. So all we knew was essentially that it spread, it was often fatal and what symptoms it caused. So very little was known about cholera. The theory at the time, the prevalent theory, was something called um, a miasma theory. A miasma doesn't really, it's not a common term in general, but it refers to, the theory refers to this idea that in built up populations, in cities and in sort of urban areas where there was, you know, poor sewage or where there was air pollution, that essentially somehow uh, these, these environmental factors would just lead to disease automatically that it somehow would stem from the, the dirtiness but they had no idea what really was the link right they didn't understand bacteria so it's just this idea that spontaneously disease would erupt uh, in these sorts of situations so essentially the authorities at the time decided to or started to look for what could be the cause of this uh, invisible disease this cholera so they developed all these theories about, you know, where, what, what could be the causes, where it's kind of emanating from and so forth. Um, so in order to systematize that search, uh, there was this physician, this doctor called John Snow, um, who wanted to systematize the search and wanted to try to find out more systematically uh, what kinds of causes, what the causes might be of cholera or how it was spreading. So not to be confused, of course, with this John Snow. Um, so he did a survey, right? So he went to different households, different families uh, in Soho and started doing a questionnaire about where they worked, how many people in the household were sick, where they did their shopping, where they bought their food, what kind of food they were eating and so forth. And he took down all of his data into some notes, into some notebooks and took uh, uh, registered lots of different data in, in those notebooks. And he eventually compiled this into a more structured form, uh, still on paper, of course. And eventually he plotted the data. So he visualized the data and what we see here, the map is of poor quality, but uh, what we can roughly see here is these black uh, boxes here refer to somehow the numbers of cases where we see, for example, a lot of cases in this area here. So we have some idea based on this, the number of cases of cholera that have emerged. 
And we see this line here. And what does this line refer to? It refers to this central element here, which is a pump, a bomba of water. So uh, what does this mean? It means that uh, somehow his theory was that the disease were, seemed to be centered around this water pump. Um, and this line here is essentially the delimiting line where uh, people outside this line are actually closer to another water pump. So they were sourcing their water from this pump within this, this boundary here. So he figured that probably the pump is, uh, is uh, an indication of what's going on. Or the pump is related to the, the outbreak. So um, he, he eventually managed to convince the authorities um, oh, sorry, so here is a, another image where we can see it maybe a little bit more clearly. Here is the other pumps. Um, this is a redrawn version of it. And here we see somehow the density of, of cases of cholera. Um, so we see that somehow there is a cluster centered around this pump. And sometimes people would maybe up here, for example, would go to work and on the way back, they would bring water from the pump. So the data gave a pretty clear picture of what might be the cause. So John Snow convinced the authorities based on these data to uh, disable the pump, to remove the handle from the pump so that it could no longer be used. And that was found to be very effective. Uh, essentially, the number of cases started going down immediately. So somehow something infected had, had got into the water supply of that pump. So you can go there today and there's the pump is still there and there is a plaque. Um, uh, recognizing John Snow's discovery in that year that cholera is conveyed by water. Okay. So you can also go there and take a selfie and whatever. So what we knew after this episode with John Snow is that, okay, cholera is an infectious and often fatal disease. We still don't know anything about bacteria typically contracted from infected water. This was a sort of a new discovery um, from infected water supplies and causing severe vomiting and diarrhea. So finding out that it spreads through infected water supplies is, uh, was a very useful finding. Even though John Snow still had no idea about bacteria, anything like this, based on the data, this was an important finding. So why was it important? Because when there were um, subsequent outbreaks of cholera after that, they would issue a boil notice where you would have to boil your water before you consumed it. And this would kill the bacteria. So without understanding any of the physical mechanisms, just based on the data, John Snow came to this conclusion. And it was a very useful conclusion that saved a lot of lives. So again, not this John Snow. Um, okay. So again, this was well before the discovery of the, yeah, 30 years before the discovery of the actual uh, bacteria that causes um, cholera. Uh, so for this reason, John Snow is known as the father of epidemiology, which is the study of the spread of disease, a data-driven science uh, relating to how disease spreads, which of course is a, a major topic at the moment. Um, so he was, you know, this was a, an important uh, innovation, let's say, in terms of collecting data about how disease spreads and using that to, to understand um, how, how disease spreads and propagates and how that can be affected. The success stories of epidemiology, since John Snow, I mean, things have advanced a lot. Uh, smallpox is dead. So smallpox has been eradicated from um, from the population. I'm not sure what the Spanish for smallpox is. I don't remember. Polio? Yeah. Uh, polio, no, it's different. Um, I used to know. I teach the course in Spanish as well, but I, I can't remember. Maybe someone can, can post it in the chat if they find out. But uh, polio is the other one. So polio, they have almost eradicated. It's still in certain areas around uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and in certain areas of Africa as well, around Nigeria. So they were hoping to eradicate it by around this year, but I think if there's still some cases active, uh, I think maybe smallpox is viruela. This one maybe say in the chat. Yeah, viruela. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks. Um, so 
um, also malaria. Um, they're working towards at least limiting it to certain areas is difficult because these mosquitoes are, are transmitting it. So it's not just human transmission. transmission. And as well as various other vaccine programs for various other diseases. And of course, we could talk about uh, COVID-19 as well, although maybe it's been less successful in containing um, that uh, particular virus. So there's been huge success stories for epidemiology and it's a data-driven uh, science effectively. Uh, value of data, of course, is not just limited to epidemiology. We could also talk about the value of data for climatology, for, um, for astronomy, for particle physics, for sociology, um, for politics, for economics, and so forth. Okay. So it, it refers to many different areas of, of society, um, the value of data. Of course, the paper notebooks that were used in the time of John Snow are no longer good enough. So, uh, okay, we've had an evolution of, of um, ways of keeping electronic data from these sorts of bombs to punch cards, to tape machines, to hard disks. And well, we have now solid state disks and we have RAM, we have main memory and so forth. So the forms of storing data uh, physically have evolved from paper notebooks, of course. Uh, this has been an important development for, for data, right? because no longer are we producing massive amounts of data, but we're, we're able to store them and to capture them quite cheaply. Okay. So any questions so far? Okay. Um, so the growth of data, okay, we need to talk a little bit about where this big data is coming from. So I could talk about terabytes and petabytes, which I, I will also do, but uh, to give an idea of the scale of data, it's useful to talk about uh, Wikipedia. It's a more useful or tangible unit of measure. So Wiki, English Wikipedia is about 50 gigabytes, we could say. This is the English version, no, no edit history. This is the XML with the tags that are needed to, to display the page. This is from 2015, it's probably maybe 70, 80 gigabytes now. But this is a rough kind of estimate of, you know, just a very rough kind of idea of, of the scale of some of the other data sets that we'll see. So we'll use the uh, unit of measure of one wiki as one English Wikipedia here. So we have Wikimedia Commons, which is the collection of all the photos and videos and images and all the, the multimedia that are used on the um, Wikimedia site. So that would be um, Wikipedia, Wikipedia, Wikidata, Wiktionary, and so forth. So this is, as you might imagine, due to the nat nature of the data, you know, video and images are often larger than text. It's considerably larger than, than Wikipedia, just the, the text. So it's about 470 times the size of, of Wikipedia. And this is around the same time, the 2014 dump. So Twitter. So how many, Twitter is a little bit different in that it's dynamic data. So it's not just one you know, collection of static data somewhere. Wikipedia is also dynamic, but not to the same extent. So how many Wikipedias, uh, equivalents of Wikipedia, do we think that uh, are shared on Twitter every day? Maybe one, maybe 0 0.5. And so we have 157 Wikipedias per day generated on Twitter, about eight terabytes per day um, of text. So it's quite, quite a lot. Um, of data. So next we have astronomy. Okay, so we have this large synoptic survey uh, telescope LSST, uh, which essentially is taking a video of the night sky and generating a lot of image data. So every night it's somehow, I'm not sure if it's doing every night, but most nights at least it's, it's capturing video of the night sky, looking for transient objects like supernova that are momentarily visible or apparent. So this is generating about 300 uh, Wikipedias per day uh, of, of data. 
uh, so about 15 terabytes, which is then filtered and the interesting events or things that might be interesting are then passed to different brokers that, that can process them in more detail. Facebook, uh, Facebook is generating about 11,800 Wikipedias per day. Now, these are, in general, it's difficult to get accurate statistics. Uh, and I've tried to update these statistics, um, but I couldn't find anything more recent. And it's also essentially incoming hive data, which means that data that's in, that's coming into their processing framework, whether what kind of data that exactly that includes, whether that includes videos that are uploaded directly to Facebook is not very clear, um, but we have a lot of data. Um, maybe not all of that is super useful to humanity, but um, super useful to Mark Zuckerberg at least. Um, so next we have, anyone recognize this? Probably that's what you do, maybe. Um, this is the Large Hadron Collider. So it's essentially uh, bashing some particles against each other and looking at the result. And it's generating about a petabyte per day. Uh, this is also the filtered data. So this is the, the stuff that they think might be interesting to hold on to, not just the, the raw sensor data. So it's generating about 20,000. Wikipedias per day, uh, this 2017 uh, estimate. We have the NSA, of course, uh, very large data processing centers. Uh, the NSA were infamously um, involved in this PRISM project with the idea of effectively uh, surveilling the world or as much of it as they could where they were um, processing around 29 petabytes per day or touching it in some way as, as in like it was going through the processing they were you know, looking for some signal and that probably they weren't storing that but uh, it was at least going through their, their processing. 600,000 Wikipedias per day. Again, this is, you know, these sorts of estimates are difficult to come at, but this was based on some of the information that was leaked in an estimate based on what they were listening to, how much data passes through there. This is a, an, an estimate of how much they were processing in some way. Uh, Google. So how much data does Google uh, in touch or involve? So it processed, again, 2014 estimates. Uh, haven't seen more recent estimates. About 100 petabytes per day, or about 2 million Wikipedias per day. Um, I presume that's pretty much everything. You know, I think that's, you know, that's all the data that they're, they're processing through the search engine. So in, a, in any case, they have massive, uh, they're processing massive amounts of data per day. They're also, you know, crawling the entire web and keeping it up to date and so forth. So, um, and in terms of the internet itself, um, these are, again, it's kind of unusual that it's hard to find statistics about this, but these are based on older statistics from Cisco, where they were talking about, um, 2.4 exabytes per day, or about 47 million, million Wikipedias per day. So uh, it's a lot of data, a lot of mostly video, I would I would imagine mostly multimedia rather than text, um, but okay. So the general picture is just that we have these massive flows of data, um, but what's happening is, you know, uh, we can store them, we can capture them relatively cheaply. What becomes the bottleneck is processing the data that's incoming. So somehow being able to take the data and make sense of them and extract value from them, this is, this is a, the kind of most complex uh, process. So um, people generally refer to the Vs of big data. So they talk about big data refers to volume in terms of the size of the data. Big data refers to velocity in terms of the speed of change uh, or variety in terms of having to process and manage many different forms of data sources or veracity in terms of the uncertainty of data. And, you know, people have also proposed other Vs um, that might be involved in big data. But essentially the idea is that big data involves somehow processing or managing massive amounts of diverse data that could be also, for example, dynamic and uncertain in the sense that it might not all be, be true, right? You might not be able to trust all of it. Um, so any questions so far? Any doubts? 
Okay. So we can um, push up to some examples of applications using big data. It's kind of weird. Sometimes. Um, so the first one is Waze. Um, I don't know uh, if you, many of you use Waze or know of Waze, um, but the idea is that it allows you to find the, the fastest route from A to B if you're driving, for example. So how it works is it processes journeys as background knowledge. So you're participating to find out the fastest way, but it's also monitoring you or using you as a sensor in the sense that it can see how you're progressing in traffic and see how long it takes you to, to get from different points. So this is kind of known as participatory sensing where you're benefiting from the application, but you also become a sensor for the application. You're also giving the application your data, which helps it to provide more accurate statistics to, to other users and possibly also to commercialize that data for other purposes. So in any case here, they're, mass, they're processing massive amounts of data and they're providing real-time predictions of, of how long it will take to get from A to B. Google Maps as well, and we can we'll provide some of their services. Um, a big issue that has been quite contra controversial recently has been um, elections, um, the use of big data for essentially targeting voters. So what people want to do in elections is they want to, if I'm a campaign manager for some presidential candidate, for example, uh, what I want to know is who are the uh, who are the people who are undecided. I don't want to talk to or, or, or waste my time with people who have already decided either for me or for for the other for the other candidate. I want to find out who is undecided and what kind of message I could send them uh, that they would listen to. And I one of the the first initiatives in this direction was uh, Barack Obama's presidential campaign in 2012. Where they had a project called Narwhal, which was essentially this office dedicated to collecting data from social media to categorize voters, to be able to then target them with specific messages, even also posting messages on, on users' behalf to their friends to try to convince them um, to, to vote for, for Barack Obama. So the question here is who are the undecided voters and how can I convince them to vote for me? And you can build for this, you know. A sort of big data style, um, massive collection of data from online sources, and then use that to target messages to voters based on their profile, the sorts of things that you think would, would speak to them. Um, so of course, this also became a big issue uh, relating to uh, Donald Trump's uh, campaign with Cambridge Analytica and so forth. One of the main differences with Cambridge Analytica and Narwhal is that Narwhal largely played by the rules of the time of Facebook and you know their their apps didn't break any terms of service. They were just you know trying to maximize within the platform the benefit for, for Barack Obama. Uh, Cambridge Analytica were using privileged data that they shouldn't have used for that purpose according to the terms of service that people had not really consented to. But the, the concept is similar. Um, winning Jeopardy. Uh, so I'm not sure if you know of the game show in the US called Jeopardy and the idea is that they give an answer and you have to give the question. Uh, it's a strange gimmick. Uh, I'm not sure why they did it that way, but so we have this answer with much gravity. This young fellow of Trinity became the Lucasian professor of mathematics in uh, 1669. Any ideas what the question might be? So with gravity is probably the big hint. Um, so it's uh, Isaac Newton. So what IBM did as a sort of uh, one of these sorts of grand challenges was to design an AI to, to beat the top uh, ever human players in uh, this Jeopardy game. And as we see, they were quite successful. Uh, more money means more success in this game. So. Um, you see, this is the guess of, of um, IBM Watson, the system that they built. And the other two were Isaac Barrow and Stephen Hawking. So we see that the highest probability was indeed Isaac Newton. So how do they build this, um, this system? They built it by indexing over 200 million pages of content and using over 100 different processing techniques. And the reason they were most, most successful is because they had the past 
history of games. So they had a sort of, if you've done machine learning or data mining, they had an extensive collection of, um, of data for evaluation, for training and testing and validation. So essentially then they could, once they had the data set, they could throw all these techniques together and just try and mix them up whatever way they could and throw in more data sets or whatever. And they could very quickly evaluate what was working, um, which, you know, I guess in these days with deep learning, it's such a, such a, um, a success or something like IBM Watson is hardly surprising anymore, but this was more surprising when it was first proposed. Um, one major area of big data within the university is uh, astronomy. So in astronomy, there, um, there are a lot of people working on processing massive amounts of data uh, relating to stars, to supernova, to various types of, of celestial objects. And, and in the astronomy department, there are lots of people working with the sorts of things we see in this course. And ex-students of this course as well have ended up working in the astronomy department. Um, so what's happening there is essentially it's becoming much more of a data-driven science. They have all these telescopes that are generating data and the data come in and have to be processed and classified and cleaned and stored and queried and so forth. So for example, in LSST, they want to know what uh, astronomic bodies, stars or other objects are changing in the sky. Um, so maybe there's a dot here of light and then moves over here. So you know somehow it's moving between the, the two observations. So you're serving the visible sky every week and then querying as well, maybe external catalogs for known information. So if you see some object, you want to be able to consult some existing catalogs to see if, if something is known about this, this uh, object that is there, as well as you know, machine learning type classification, um, various other types of processing. So, okay, any questions? No? Okay, we can take a, a break soon. We'll go until three o'clock and then we can take a 10 minute break. Um, so when talking about processing data, every application is different. So data can be semi-structured relational databases, semi-structured or structured data relational databases, JSON, XML, CSV, HTML forms, you know, this sort of stuff. Structured data, there's different definitions of this, but uh, structured data mostly refers to something with a relational schema, a relational database. Semi-structured is where it doesn't have a defined schema like you have in a relational database, yeah, like in JSON and XML, where you could just stick in a new attribute or a new property somewhere in the document and nobody really cares, right? And unstructured data, which text, documents, comments, tweets, and so forth, and something in between. Like we could have maybe tweets have some structure because they have tags and they have mentions, or HTML documents have mostly text, but they might have some tables and, and so forth. Um, processing can involve data management. That could be you know the sort of database side of things, like indexing, querying, uh, applying joins, and aggregation but now possibly over semi-structured data and possibly at a much larger scale than what we would see in, in typical relational database scenarios. It could involve, for example, natural language processing, like uh, searching for keywords, topic extraction, and some sort of entity, um, some sort of text processing, uh, entity recognition, machine translation. It could involve, for example, data mining and statistics, uh, so pattern recognition, classification, regression, recommendations, uh, whatever that might be, or something else in the mix. So it, it can involve many different things, right? So it, these are underlined here because these are the things that we will be focusing on in, in this course over, over big data, uh, more generic techniques and more the concepts of big data than specific techniques. We won't speak uh, specifically about data mining and statistics because there's other lots of courses dedicated to that. Uh, to those topics. So we'll be um, speaking more about data management, uh, data processing uh, over large amounts of data. So if we can have all sorts of different types of data and all different types of processing, the question is where do we start, right? I mean, it seems very broad what, what we would like to, to talk about, you know? Um, so the first thing is that scale is a common factor. Okay, so I think we're coming close to three o'clock. So what I can do is just leave it on this question. I'll introduce the question. 
I have an algorithm. Um, I have a machine that can process 1,000 input items in an hour. If I buy a machine that is n times as powerful, how many input items can I process in an hour? Okay. Um, so we, with that, we can uh, take a break. If I quit out here, you might be able to see the answer. I'll go back up here a little bit. Um, so I'll post the question as well in the chat. Let me stop to share first. So let's return at, um, at 3, 310. So 15, 10, and uh, I will post, I don't actually have a calendar for the process activist, but I'll post uh, one from the old calendar. So you can find it if you want to participate in that. Uh, just the old to the calendar. Mm. Verification. So post one. And the question. No. <laughs> okay, so you in um, uh, three ten. Meanwhile, if anyone has any questions. So uh, we got some some answers in the in the chat, um, some discussion in the chat. So we can look at that. Um, no, no chat. Where's the chat? So there was a question. I can't see the chat while I'm sharing. I don't know why. Where it's disappeared to? No, not working. Um, so there was uh, someone asked about uploading the slides. Uh, I usually upload them just after the class. If you want me to upload them just before the class, if you'd like to have the slides, let me know, just uh, mention it in the forum and I can try to upload the slides just before the class. And, um, somebody mentioned about uh, 1000 then. Uh, another person mentioned about it depends on what you mean by n times is powerful. And somebody else mentioned that it depends on the algorithm. Uh, in times as powerful, it's sort of an abstraction, right? So it's it's true that you you can't really just have a machine that's n times as powerful because then you need to think about parallelism, having different CPUs, access to the memory, and, and so forth. But this is a more abstract question. So in fact, the question is sort of underspecified because it precisely depends on the algorithm, even abstracting away those computational details about what n times as powerful means. Um, it depends on the complexity of the algorithm. Um, so those of you from computer science should recognize this sort of notation here in terms of the algorithm being lineal or li linear, um, quadratic, cubic to the four, polynomial in general or exponential. So these are representations of how the how the number of um, steps somehow um, increases as the input increases. So, for example, just you know, finding some, some, uh, or just processing, just reading the data is an O-N process, right? Uh, trying to find pairs that have a certain distance from each other because you have to look at all the pairs of, of inputs. Not necessarily, but that could be, for example, a quadratic uh, measure if you wanted to check the distances uh, between all pairs of, of, of inputs and so forth. And then we have exponential processes where, for example, unless p equals np, the sort of np, the algorithms we have for np hard, or np complete, I guess, specifically, problems would be exponential right now. So what's the point? The point is that if we have a machine that's processing 1,000 items per hour and then we have a machine that's twice as, as powerful, it doesn't mean that we'll be able to necessarily uh, process 2,000 items. It would be in this case if we have a, a linear algorithm. If it's quadratic, then it would, you would be processing twice the uh, the machine machinery, twice the processing power. You would be processing rather something like 1,414 uh, um, inputs after doubling the, the amount of machines. And so on. So if the algorithm is exponential, well, if you're processing uh, 
you know, a thousand input items per hour and something that's exponential, you have a very powerful machine already and doubling the machine, you're not going to be able to process any meaningful number more of, 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 um, of inputs. So it depends on the algorithm, it depends on the complexity of the algorithm. So adding more machines is often, it can help if your process is, you know, maybe n or n log n uh, sorting, for example. But if it's quadratic, you know, there's not much you can really do. Yeah, even if you had a hypothetical machine that was n times as powerful, it's not really going to, at some stage, you're going to reach a point where a scale becomes very difficult. So, um, so often quadratic is too much, not to talk about cubic uh, to four or uh, exponential processes, for example. Here, just to note that this is not the same machine in the sense that uh, you know, something that can process 1,000 input items in a linear algorithm is not going to be the same necessarily as something that can process 1,000 input items on an exponential machine. So that's part of the reason why this is so flat and this continues increasing is that this line here, this is already a very, very powerful machine, whereas it's not necessarily the case for the linear algorithm. So the message here is it just depends on what you're doing. Yeah. So just adding more machines is not going to help you all that much if your process, if your algorithm is already very expensive. Yeah. So certain, only certain types of algorithms will permit scale. And typically we would say they are processes that are O n linear, by linear or O n log n, which is sorting, for example, would be a typical example. In this case, adding more machines can definitely, or adding more powerful machines can, can definitely help. So the second question then is, do we, should we prefer, hopefully that's okay. Any questions or doubts about that? So I just want to remove the idea that we can scale everything. That's not the case. There are certain algorithms that we just cannot scale. Um, in the, those cases, what would we do? Probably we would search for approximations. We would try to find something good enough that's not as expensive, or we would just give up. There are certain things we can't do, right? They're just not feasible to compute. Um, so if there's no approximations, that makes sense. So second question, do we go for one machine that's n times as powerful or do we want n machines that are equally as powerful? Um, again, this is a slightly underspecified question, right? So, but okay, let's have a look, let's think about it. Um, so do we want a supercomputer that's everything is in one box and we have shared memory and, you know, maybe have lots of CPUs or do we prefer to just add more and more machines that are in a network, right? So here, each of these things here is a machine and they're connected by network cables. And again, it really depends. So we can sort of very loosely categorize two types of scenario. The first type is data intensive where we have inexpensive algorithms. Like we just want to sort things or index things very simply, but we have very large inputs. This is the sort of stuff that Google does, that Facebook does, that Twitter does. They're not doing anything super advanced over their data, over the, let's say, so in some cases, yes, right? But it, let's say Google's web indexing, um, it's, it's cool, it's search engine, it's doing some fancy things, but the general processing is just extracting words from pages and then indexing them in an encrypted index in a special type of index. So these are data intensive. Then we have more compute intensive where we have smaller inputs, but we have more expensive algorithms. And these tend to often be sort of simulations or, you know, prediction, future predictions based on uh, initial states and in complex uh, systems. So these are things like climate simulations, things like chess games. You have your input chess game is very simple. Then you have to explore all these different possibilities to, to rank different your next options, various forms of combinatorial problems. So um, in general, our focus will be on data intensive uh, scenarios. And in that case, what has become the co most common thing is to use multiple machines for data intensive scenarios. Of course, there's no black and white here, but these are just sort of general, um, general generalizations. So in the case of data intensive kind of settings, distributed computing has become the, the norm. Uh, why is that? It's a lot cheaper to just add and a lot more simple to add more machines that are networked, just connected by a cable, rather than trying to have this super powerful machine that uh, has shared memory and so forth. 
So commodity hardware in general, you can just buy lots and lots of normal servers, normal machines, and just connect them on the, on the network. Um, so even in the origin of Google around 98, they understood the need for, for multiple machines. This was, you know, they had maybe six or seven desktops here indexing the web. They also built a, a, a NAS, a network attached storage, just storage basically out of Lego. So they could put all their hard drives in there. So this Lego thing at one stage uh, indexed to the web. Um, Google still needs more than one machine. <laughs> Google needs thousands upon thousands upon thousands of, machine, of machines. So here we see racks of machines and each rack might have, I don't know, 10, 20 machines in them. So distributed computing has become the norm for these scenarios. And in distributed computing to understand maybe some of the concepts, we need to think a little bit about data transport costs. So this is the main downside of, of distributed computing. So we can start with what, are, what sorts of things we can, where we can read data from. So we can read data from a memory, we can read it from a solid state disk, we can read it from a hard disk, we can read it from the network, or we could read it okay, in the same rack, which is just this, these cabinets, these sorts of uh, vertical things, or across rocks where we have lots and lots of these vertical rocks and machines and we need to read from one across the other. So we need to go across a network switch. So, okay, we have main memory, solid state disk, hard disk, network same rock, which would be a bit faster-ish, and network across the rocks. So we want to read data from these different locations. So we want to read it into a CPU to process the data. So let's have a look at some numbers. So first of all, we can look at bandwidth, which is how much, you know, what kind of stream of data we can process. So this is 30 gigabytes per second. These are, hardware varies a lot. So these are just typical estimates. Uh, 30 gigabytes per second from main memory, we could get, for example, from solid state disk, 600 megabytes per second. Hard disk, about 100 megabytes per second. Uh, the network, we can transfer maybe 1.25 gig, uh, gigabytes per second. So that would be 10 gigabit ethernet, ethernet, I guess. And here, this would be 40 gigabit ethernet or five gigabytes per second across racks. Okay. So these are some figures of how much data we can read um, per, per unit of time across these different interfaces. And then in terms of latency, how long it takes, if we send a request, how long it takes for the first kind of bytes of data to come back. Main memory has a latency in 50 to 150 nanoseconds. Uh, solid state disk, microseconds. Hard disk, milliseconds. Okay, so there's a big difference here already between main memory and hard disk. These are five orders of magnitude, let's say. Um, network um, nanoseconds and network across racks would be microseconds. So we have a bit more latency even though the bandwidth is higher. So what does all this mean? It means, okay, where do we want to read data from? Ideally, we want to read it from main memory. Now, it looks like actually reading from the network is not so bad, but we have to think that we don't actually really read from the network. What we do is communicate on the network with another machine and that machine must have the data in main memory or solid state disk or hard disk. So it's sort of the network is added to the cost of, of whatever we access the data from on the machine on the other side of the network. Also, for example, in the case of network across racks, this is often more congested. There's a lot more, you know, there's a lot of data going between these rack switches than within individual racks. So if we just uh, think that, okay, our bandwidth is better here, but we can easily eat all of that up if we start uh, communicating across different racks. So what's the point here? The point is that it's important to minimize the network overhead in so far as possible. So we'd rather try to work locally on each machine and send as little data as possible between the different machines. Uh, the network gives an additional cost. And the network is also shared across many machines, particularly across the racks, right? So we don't want to congest this network. Uh, so in general, we can see that there's some, you know, if we're doing data intensive processing, how fast we can read the data and what sort of latency is important for queries or for lookups. How fast we can stream the data into a CPU is important for, for the processing rate. So we see that, you know, it's going to be much more efficient to, to use the main memory, but main memory capacity is limited. So um, 
you know, it's more economic to use a hard disk or a solid state disk. And then eventually when we can't work on one machine alone or data are too large for one machine, we need to use the network. Any questions or doubts? Okay. So we need to think very carefully about where to put what data if we're using multiple machines. So let's take an example where I have four machines to run a website and I have 10 million users. Each user has personal profile data, photos, friends, and games. So how should I split the data up over the machines? Um, any ideas? Algunas ideas puede ser en castellano también. So there's two, two ideas that might jump into our minds. Right. Any suggestions? Okay, so forgive my, my uh, I'm sure people are thinking about these ideas. So forgive my poor drawing, I don't have a stylus or whatever. Okay, uh, 2.5 million. One idea is that we put 2.5 million users on each machine, right? So we have 10 million users, so we divide it by four, 2.5 million, and then each machine stores all the data, photos, friends, and games for each user. Okay, so the data for all the users are on one machine. Okay, so that's option one. Hopefully that that stays clear. Option two, um, let's see, would be to have, um, uh, so we have a personal profile personal profiles, photos on another machine where we have friends and we have games. Okay, so this machine here is dedicated to, this is an alternative, right? So we have personal profile data here, photos here. Uh, we have friends here and we have games here. Uh, so which should we do, right? So we're working in a company and we have 10 million users and we say, hey, we need to figure out how, how we should use these machines. Um, so what do you think? Any, any ideas? Okay, so let's see, let's see the first one. Um, what's good about this, right? So what's good about this is that if we're looking for, if in our application we're generating a page for a user and the page has the data, the profile data, the photos, the friends and the games all in one page. If we do it, uh, what, we, what we will find is we can get all of the data for that one user for one machine, right? In this case. In this case, we'll have to ask four machines each time to get all the data that we need for one user, right? So essentially we can somehow reduce the traffic um, for in such a case for, for this, okay? So this is maybe, you know, uh, good to start with, but maybe as well, you know, um, maybe we just like to, to keep these things separate. Maybe they're easier to manage if we have, you know, we'll only need the software for personal profile data on this machine and we need a special uh, photo software on, on this machine and so forth. So there might also be benefits to, to this sort of arrangement. So if it were a larger setting, uh, I would say this might work better. So we could dedicate three machines to personal profile data, and six machines with large hard drives to, to photos and so forth. But probably in this sort of scenario, it depends a lot, but this could probably be better just to split the data by, by users and have a chunk of the, well, the profile data, photos, friends, and games in each machine. Um, so I'm not saying there's a definitive option here, but hopefully you understand some of the, the benefits, right, uh, between both options. Um, okay, so it depends on the application, it depends on the number of factors, but some general principles and some choices apply. So this idea of can we read the data for one machine, can we process more data on one machine, um, you know, how, how do we balance the different machines, maybe 
For example, if we have the person, another issue would be if we just have four machines here and we have the games. Uh, the games probably won't use that much data, so the disk will be free, but the CPU could be very high. Whereas for photos, we're not going to do all that much processing, so the CPU will be nothing, but the um, um, the disk will be used a lot. So somehow there will be an imbalance in how the machines are being used. So another thing we need to think about as well in terms of general principles is failures. We need to plan for some machine runoff. So general machines are reliable, they only fail, you know, hard disks, for example, that are average lifespan of maybe about 10 years, which is great. But if you have thousands upon thousands of, of hard disks, if you have 3,650 hard disks, then you're already more than likely to have a hard disk fail every day at that rate. So um, we need to think about failures as well and code for that in the, in the process. So if we think about failures that one of the machines could fail, well, we need to think even more carefully about where to put the data, right? So now it's a question of, you know, do we want to lose, which is better? Do we want to lose all of the data for 2.5 million users? Or do we want to lose uh, all of the photos or the photos for all of the users, right? So which is better? I don't know, um, that depends, right? But uh, ideally we could avoid losing any of this stuff, right? So to avoid losing this stuff, what we might need to do is have some redundancy. So just to take the example of the users, right? Instead of having 2.5 million users per machine, we could actually have 3.3 million users per machine. Uh, or we could have you know, uh, all 10, 10 million users on, on each machine to make sure that we're you know, highly uh, redundant. But the idea would be to maintain copies so that we have at least um, two copies, but hopefully three copies on, on different machines of all the data. Right? So we have somehow what we call replication. Um, so again, this depends on the application. It depends on how bad it would be if we lose data. It depends on what space we have. But again, you know, something like replication is a, is a good thing to have. So if we lose a machine that we can continue working, um, which is similar in the sense of the of whatever you'd like to think about. For example, in an office where different people have different tasks, if there's, I don't know, one guy who's the only person who can do some very urgent uh, task, like maybe one guy who can take care of the taxes or something, and that person is sick or becomes unavailable, um, maybe they get cholera or something, then you, know, you want somebody else uh, there who can want some other machine or some other knowledge to be able to take over that job. So it's kind of common sense uh, in terms of replication. So again, as mentioned before, distribution is not always applicable. It's, there's just certain cases where, where we the algorithm is too complex and we can't scale by just adding more machines. So distributed development can also be difficult. So it's more in terms of practical uh, aspects. Distributed systems can be complex to manage. We have multiple machines and we need to take care of data in different locations logs and messages in different machines, different users. Balance, we need to think about load balancing, we need to be able to handle failures um, and so forth. So there's a lot of things that uh, become more complicated when we're programming or developing systems for several machines versus for one machine. And they might not be obvious at the start. And they can be even more complex when we consider that we might have a lot of data. Um, so tasks may also take a long time. So you know this this thing of uh, I'll, I'll program something, I'll try it and see what happens. You know, and if it doesn't work, then I'll fix it. It doesn't work if something you know you're going to be processing data that will take hours or days. So you need to approach the problem in a different way. You know, maybe doing some testing with a smaller set of data. They, there can be some challenges associated uh, with the processing lots of data as well. So the good news is that there's a lot of frameworks and abstractions that can help a whole lot with this, that can take care of a lot of the problems that are faced in general in, in, in these sorts of scenarios. So for distributed processing, we have frameworks like Hadoop or Spark or Pig or Kafka. And we'll talk about all of those in the course. And for distributed storage, we have these NoSQL systems, HBase, Cassandra, MongoDB, Solar, Neo4j. Again, you might have heard uh, of some of them. You might maybe have even used some of these systems, and we'll, we'll talk more about them in the course. 
So essentially, we don't have to start from scratch, right? Uh, we can just use one of these existing frameworks um, for, for whatever task we need. Not whatever task we need, but for common tasks that we would like to, to solve using uh, distributed system. Um, any questions? Okay. Um, I don't know if I have time to go through this section, so uh, it would be interesting. I want to talk for sure today about the structure of the course. So um, I'll present this at the start of the lab. I think I'll skip this. And so this will, I try to keep the classes in general to an hour. Um, so if I can't, um, if I can't finish something, I'll just use the first 10, 10 minutes or 15 minutes of the lab to explain it. Um, I'll present the course first, which is definitely something we want to present today. And if we have time, we can, we can see. So about the course, uh, the course is focused on data intensive uh, processing rather than compute intensive processing. Uh, we talk about distributed tasks, not networking. I, I don't really talk all that much about networking. It's just like maybe some minor details like racks and so forth and where that affects how you design certain tasks. Um, commodity hardware, not supercomputers. So we're really talking about standard servers, machines that are connected by a network rather than a, a crane or, or some crazy supercomputer. Uh, general methods. So just the main goal is not to teach you specific algorithms, but rather to give you a general idea of how to how to implement algorithms on on clusters and machines and distributed. Uh, distributed scenarios and practical methods. So there's little or no theory. It's mainly kind of, uh, well, there are theoretical concepts, but there's no like uh, formal notation and things like that. It's mostly focused on being able to, to process lots of data in practice. Um, so in terms of the topics, we'll have one week just on the basics, on the basics of distributed computing, which will be the topic of next week. We'll have five weeks of distributed processing frameworks where you learn how to use these frameworks to process lots of data over lots of machines. Um, we'll have a couple of weeks on text, processing text at large scale in terms of indexing. So here in this section, as you mentioned, sorry, that we'll work with a little bit with text, but mostly in the kind of structured data. Here we'll focus on, focus on indexing text for search, uh, also things like ranking and so forth. Um, we'll have three weeks of distributed databases, which will be essentially no SQL systems. Um, and then we'll have some time for projects, hopefully. Um, so in terms of the course structure, we'll have um, lectures on Monday. We will have labs on Wednesday. Um, you can work in groups if you attend the session. Uh, we'll have sessions in Discord for, for labs starting this Wednesday. Uh, if you um, cannot attend the session, you can, if, if you can attend the session, you can either attend on a Friday uh, with your group or you, you must work alone. So you must attend the group, uh, the session essentially to work in a group, a group of um, maximum three. So there will be sessions on Friday where you continue to work in the labs and you can also ask the OCDI um, some questions or doubts or uh, resolve any issues you might have. The slides will be uploaded to this homepage here. I'll add the link to the course books, of course. Uh, in terms of the course marking, so normally there would be two controls, but in, in the current um, the online um, modality, um, we'll, there will be no control. So there will be marking for 80% for weekly labs. Uh, there's 11 labs in total. So, um, Four of those labs will be obligatory. These are the most important labs for the course. They are the ones that I think are the most important concepts that you know I, I would like you to learn in doing the labs will help you learn about those, those concepts. And uh, four out of the remaining seven labs will count. So um, I, I, in general, I would highly recommend to, to try all of the labs. Um, all of the labs are important. I don't want to say you can skip three and it's fine. If you have the time, if you have the opportunity, I would recommend to, to look at all the labs because you learn um, the labs are quite useful in terms of learning for this course. And lastly, there's 20% for a class project, which is basically 
do something that involves something in the course. It's very open. So find some data, propose some analysis you'd like to do and use some techniques or some framework you learned something about in the course to, to for example, analyze some data. Um, so good news, bad news, bad news assignments each week, and working in groups, uh, good news hands on each week and working in groups. So there's good side and bad side, I guess, to that. Um, outcomes, learn about big data, um, learn about particularly the engineering aspect of big data, uh, how to process massive amounts and manage massive amounts of data. Another side of big data that we will not speak about specifically will be more of the sort of learning aspects, the AI, but that, that's something that's covered in quite a lot of other courses uh, in the lab with sort of deep learning. Um, so there's quite a lot of courses on machine learning in general available. Uh, outcomes, uh, how to manage data in networks, how to as well, you know, uh, have fault tolerance and how to keep your data secure and not lose data in distributed settings. Um, you learn about various frameworks that you can use and that you'll be able to leverage in the future for processing massive amounts of data that will make your life a lot easier. That you can also, you know, data run on something like Amazon Web Services, AWS, on Google Cloud, for example, uh, where you can rent machines, get your data, get your data into the machines, and then just process them over uh, with those machines. Um, and you can also learn quite a lot about you know, how different websites manage their data. So different concepts that, that need to be considered in terms of managing the data, massive amounts of data and you know, these sorts of websites. Um, so I want the friend to talk about Twitter, but I promise I'll, I'll return to that at the start of the map. I'll give a 10 minute discussion to maybe give some interesting design choices in the context of Twitter um, that are maybe not so intuitive. But, uh, that makes sense. So, any questions or doubts? Everything is clear. So, um, we'll have the first lab on on Wednesday. Uh, one aspect is that um, there will be some stuff to install. Mainly, what you would need to install would be uh, Java. So, we use Java a lot in the course, um, which is mainly because most of the big data frameworks that you use uh, are implemented with or otherwise compatible with Java. So, Java covers everything that we'll see. Um, so, you would need something like Eclipse or IntelliJ uh, and Java installed. I'll post some instructions and also some, some small tests that you can run. Um, there are about four of the labs for involve Java, uh, so uh, hopefully that's not a, an issue in general. Um, again, I think it's there are things that are available in Python, for example, but they're interpreted and they're not the way it's done in practice um, because Python being an interpreted language is not so direct and Java being interoperable running in the JVM, you can just install the JVM in multiple machines and it's kind of easy to get Java running in distributed environments um, in an interoperable way. Um, what else would you need to mention? Um, yeah, all the slides and the class and the video, the videos I'll upload to YouTube, class uh, slides, everything will be uploaded. Um, Yep. Uh, no other questions? In Castellano? Okay. Uh, en el chat, profe. Profe, ah, ¿sí? hay, preguntas en el chat. hay preguntas en el chat. Ah, no puedo ver el chat. Uh, ha desaparecido. Voy a... I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to uh, stop the recording. So. Uh, 